you have your Bibles, Hosea chapter 11, we are looking at what we call the Old Testament. Jesus called it the Law and the Prophets. It's a record of the people that God raised up to bring his salvation to me and you. It's a record of the failure of those people. It's a record of the faithfulness of God to finish and bring salvation through them to the world. One of the things we see is that these people, the people of Israel, they need the very salvation that God is going to bring through them as much as we need it. There's no one, we're all made of the same metal. We all need help. We all need salvation. We all need God to rescue us. Chapter 11 of Hosea, he starts in. And he said, God speaking through Hosea says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And so this chapter begins with God nostalgically reflecting upon his tender love for Israel. And he specifically refers to a time that was 500 years before Hosea spoke these words. 500 years before when God brought his people out of Egypt. He started with one man, Abraham. He had a son named Isaac and then Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They turned into the children of Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. When there were 70 people, there was a famine in the land that God gave and promised to Abraham, the land of Israel. 4,000 years ago, God promised Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. Well, there was a famine when they were about 70. The family was about 70 people. And so they went, the whole story of Joseph going before them, and Joseph was raised up after 14 years in an Egyptian prison He was raised up as second in command next to the Pharaoh of Egypt, and they were able to receive this family. They were saved from the famine. God provided. He sent Joseph ahead. Well, they were there 400 years in Egypt, and they multiplied. Many people, many scholars believe to about a million and a half people. And it was in the days of Moses, when Moses was born, that the, that the Egyptians were oppressing the people of Israel in Egypt. Harsh slavery. And they began to cry out to God, God, please. Well, God raised up Moses. God had prepared Moses. A long preparation. God's always, you know, God's preparing somebody. He's preparing a situation right now for you. For whatever trouble you're in. And Moses brought the people, remember the story? He brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness. Okay, now they're about a million and a half people. The Lord says when Israel was a child, when there was the 12 sons of Jacob, when there were 70 people, I looked at this little infant nation. And he says, oh, I loved, I loved them. And out of Egypt, out of Egypt, I called my son. And as they called them, verse 2, so they went from them and they sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense and carved to the carved images. So God called Israel out of Egypt, if you remember the story, to take them into their own land. It was an 11-day journey that took them 40 years because of their unbelief. And they're complaining and there's this sin in the wilderness. But as they went and they arrived finally into the land, they were actually going back into the land that they previously had occupied in the days of Abraham, the the land that God promised to these people that he was raising up to bring salvation to the whole world. When they re-entered the land later by the hand of Joshua, 
Remember, Moses died in the wilderness and Joshua led the people into the promised land. They arrived into the land and they just started worshiping the idols of Canaan. <laughs> this, is what, this is the picture here. God's like, oh, he's lamenting. He's lamenting. They, I, I brought them into this beautiful land. I brought them out of bondage in Egypt and they forsook, they turned their back on me. And they started following these Canaanite idols, the Baals of Canaan. And God reflects. In verse 3, he says, I taught Ephraim. Okay, now Ephraim was the largest of the ten northern tribes of Israel. And so sometimes God is referring to the whole northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes, as Ephraim. So he's still talking about the same group of people here, the ten northern tribes. Okay. He says, I, I taught Ephraim to walk. You know, I have two kids. One's 21 years old and one's 17. My daughter's 21, my son's 17. I taught them to walk. I taught them to walk. I took Ephraim, I taught Ephraim to walk, God says, taking them by the arms. But they didn't know. They were too young to know that it was I that healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from the neck, took it off their neck. I stooped, I stooped down <laughs> to feed them. God's just pouring out his love and affection for his people that have turned their back on him. God does so much for his people that we don't realize it's him that's doing it. And by the way, as Gentile believers in Israel's Messiah, we are his people, okay? It says in Romans chapter 11, you can read this later, that as believers, if you're a Christian, interestingly enough, you're a believer in Israel's Messiah, and you've been grafted in to the people of God. You're a full-fledged member of the household of God. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, if you're taking notes, now therefore, Paul the apostle here is speaking to a, a church of Gentiles, of non-Jews, and he says to them, you are now therefore no longer strangers, and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints, and you are members of the household of God. Okay, you've been grafted into everything that God started with Abraham. We're full blown, it says in Galatians, we're sons and daughters of Abraham through faith. We have some here among us that are actual sons and daughters, genetically sons and daughters of Abraham. We've got us. A few Jewish people, I'm not going to point them out. It's a tense time if you're Jewish. We don't want to draw any attention. But God does so much for his people. He does so much for us that we are unaware of. Like a baby is unaware. But God says, I taught Ephraim how to walk. I taught Ephraim how to walk. I took him by the arms. But they didn't know that it was me that healed them. You know, I was th reading this and I was thinking how often we attribute what is actually the blessing of God and we're unaware, we attribute it to some other source, you know. Well, it was my sharp mind that gained me this wealth. Well, who gave you that sharp mind, you know? It was my giftedness that opened that door for me. Well, who gave you that gift? It was God. Everything we have, he's given us. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. And so the this beautiful illustration of a parent teaching their child how to walk, holding the child's arms. Remember that? That was you one day. Your parents taught you that, or your grandpa. I remember those days holding my daughter and, you know, my wife's on the other end. Come on, you can do it. They take one step and it's like... It's time to party, and they fall. 
you know? One step was amazing, now try two. Maybe that describes you. You've taken a step and then you've fallen. And what, you think God's done with you? He's, he's so stoked you made that one step. The opposite of what you think. And then you take two steps, like a little drunken, you know, wino, a little midget wino, you know, <laughs> and you fall. I taught, God says, I taught Ephraim how to walk. I drew them, notice here, with gentle cords, with bands of love. Interesting. With gentle cords and bands of love. There's an old time preacher named Adam Clark who I had no idea before I studied this out. But Adam Clark, who was, in the, he was an 18th century preacher, he, sa- he said this is a reference to what were called leading strings on one end, which is held by the child and on the other by the nurse by which the little one feeling some support and gaining confidence endeavors to walk and Leah who works in our office found a 16th century painting I didn't I had no idea that that there were this was a practice it was a practice thousands of years ago in Israel with the Israelites and with other cultures but There were these cords of love. This is all the same thing. I I had you by the arms. I I tied the cords and I taught you how to walk. Okay? God draws his people with gentle cords of love. Notice how he describes it. Gentle cords of love. Not with harsh manipulation or coercion. Anybody who stands in a pulpit should look at this verse because there's hundreds of verses that say the same thing in different ways all through the Bible. God doesn't beat his sheep. He doesn't drive his sheep like cattle with a whip from behind. He goes before his sheep and he calls us by name. Come on, take a step. You know, with gentle cords of love. (coughs) God wants to win us over. He wants us to respond to his love by our loving him back. He doesn't want to use force. He wants our hearts. That's why we don't talk about giving here. Because once you coerce people or twist their arm, God doesn't want it. Okay? God doesn't need your money. There's a lot of preachers that are they're like telling you, no, God needs your money and you need to give and there's a guilt trip. Paul said that if it's not freely given, it's all wrecked. He doesn't want to coerce us in any way or twist our arm or pressure us. But he draws us with cords of love, with kindness. This is how God has been working in Israel. This is what Hosea is bringing in this message. This is how God is working in our lives because we are now his people. We're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens and members, full-fledged members of the household of God through faith in Israel's Messiah, in Jesus. He's been so good. He's been so kind. Has he been patient with you? Oh my gosh, how patient he is with me. I'm such a mess. (laughs) 43 years and I'm still stumbling. You know, how we doing, guys? Better than we deserve, right? Pretty much, that's our story. Notice God says, I was to them as those who loose the yoke from their neck and I stoop to feed them. I'm the one who looses the yoke from your neck. And here he is speaking now, the metaphor changes, and there's this yoke that would go upon the oxen, the neck of the oxen, so that it could pull the plow. Okay, and God says, I'm the one who looses the yoke around your neck, giving, which was giving the animal rest, you know, giving them the freedom to breathe. God wants to give you space to breathe. He wants you to rest. I'm the one who takes the yoke off of you. I'm the one who's been doing this for you. And God would say tonight, 
I'm not the one who's been putting a heavy trip on you. There are those that will put a heavy trip on you. That's not me, God says. I didn't do that to you. I'm not doing that to you and I will never do that to you. I'm not the one putting that on you. I'm the one who takes the yoke, the burden. I take it off of you. I don't put it on. There are two unbearable yokes of bondage that God wants to bring us, free us from. One is the bondage of just living as a slave to our fleshly appetites and sin. The other yoke of bondage that Paul speaks about in the New Testament, the book of Galatians, is the yoke of guilt-tripping, fear-mongering religion, legalism, okay? God doesn't open the prison door and lead you out of the prison of sin only to bring you into the prison of legalistic, heavy-trip religion. What God does is he seeks to free us from both of these prisons and he woos us to himself. He's on the other end saying, come on, take another step. But I fell again. Yeah, you took two steps. Take three next time. You'll get it. You'll get it. Keep trying. He woos us to himself. This is where he's calling us, not to this yoke of bondage and sin or this yoke of religious heavy trip. He brings us to walk with him. He brings us, he woos us into his presence. He's, his love, that we might know his love, that it might work in us and then through us. That's everything that he's doing in our lives. I think of Jesus calling out to those who were being oppressed in the first century by the heavy religious trip of the scribes and the Pharisees. Matthew 18, 28, come unto me. Come unto me. Come unto me, all you who are weary, tired, and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, he says. And learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm not putting a trip on you. Somebody's putting a trip on you. That's what this whole world is about. The world world and the world of religion is about heavy yokes, putting trips on you, manipulation. Jesus came and said, I'm I'm bringing you out of all of that. That's what I do for you. And he says, I stoop. I stooped to feed them. God humbled himself to minister to his people. God stooped to feed him. This blows my mind. (laughs) It's so humbling that God humbles himself to lift us up. You know, Paul was blown away about how God humbled himself in Christ. He was so blown away, he wrote in Philippians 2, 5, he said, let this mind be in you. I don't know if we have it up there, but Philippians 2, 5, if you're taking notes. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, he didn't consider his, the fact that he was God, something he had to grasp onto. When you really are something, you don't have nothing to prove. But he humbled himself. He emptied himself into human skin. He made himself of no reputation, taking upon himself the form of a bondservant. God empties himself into human skin and goes to the lowest as a servant, a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. Listen to this. Being found in appearance as a man, He humbled himself further and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. For what? To serve you, to wash your feet, to take away your sin, to show his love for you. Every time I consider Philippians chapter two, I'm I'm embarrassed because God humbled himself who am I to walk around like acting like I'm somebody and better than other people? If God humbled himself, 
It's humbling. It's so humbling. Consider that God stoops. He stoops down to feed us, to save us. Let that bring you, let it bring you humbled into his presence. But notice, they took God's patience, his forbearance, as a signal that everything would be hunky-dory if they just continued to ignore him and pursue their idols. And God says in verse 5, they shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king because they're going to be taken into exile. He's going to spank. And his, when God disciplines his kids, when he gives us his good spanking, it's not contrary to his love for us. It's because he loves us. In Hebrews, it tells us that if, if you're without chastisement, it means you don't belong to God because whom the Lord loves, he chastens. If you love your child, you'll discipline your child. The, big, the best thing, if you're not a parent yet, okay, if, you, if you haven't gotten married, maybe you're married, you haven't had kids yet, you have about four to seven years to make that kid socially acceptable. (laughs) If your kid's like throwing himself on the floor and throwing stuff at the wall and being all rebellious, he's going to grow up with every single person around him going, this, you, that little. And and, and the kid's soul is going to feel it. Like everybody hates me. (laughs) Okay? But if you teach your kid... You can't do that. You can't do that. You need to be respectful. You need to be thankful. Everyone around them is going to be like going, I love this kid. (laughs) You know what what a favor you'll be doing your child? That's why the Bible says if you spare the rod, you actually spoil the child. He who fails to discipline hates his child, the Bible says. And there's a whole topic on how to discipline. We're talking a little bit of sting on the little, little padded place that God created, that we all have one of these, two of these. It's a little pad. You can't get hurt. You can't get injured. And there's a whole way to discipline like God disciplines us. Okay? The Assyrian is going to be your king. Okay? If you love to worship idols, I'm going to take you to idol land, you know? You like Disney? You're going to Disneyland. You know, I'm going to take you to Assyria. You're going to have your fill of idols. The Assyrian is going to be your king because they refused to repent. Notice this. It wasn't so much the sin that they stumbled into that got them into trouble. It was their refusal to repent. James says in James chapter 3, verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. How true is that? Anybody here, you don't, you, you don't sin anymore since you come to Christ? I met people that have s- said that. I'm just like, dude, talk about delusion. It says in 1 John, if you say you have no sin, you're deceived and the truth isn't in you. But there's, there's guys that actually are like, I haven't sinned since I received Christ. I'm like, you haven't been down to the beach on a hot day yet, have you, for a while? <laughs> You know, like the old beautiful hymn says, we're prone to wander, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We don't get, we don't get into a total mess because we struggle with sin or stumble. We all stumble in many ways. It's when we refuse to turn back, which is what repent means, to turn back to God. I, I, he's, he's holding my arms, I stumble. If I just sit there and smash my hands on the ground and go, I'm never going to try to walk again. No, you get back up and you, you, you go back to God. They set you up again and you go for it again. Try three or four steps this time. You see? This is what gets us into trouble. This is how we get deeper and deeper into it until everything is falling apart. Until, and, 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 and there's now an unbearable mess It's their stubborn refusal to turn back after they've sinned. So not turning back to God, they're heading right into trouble, into real pain. Notice, the sword shall slash in the cities, devour his districts, consume them because of their own counsels. 
because they were like, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I don't need God's help as your whole life is disintegrating. You ever met those guys? You're so smart. You're so wise. You know what wisdom is seen in a life that works? Okay, there's a lot of people that talk. There's a lot of people on TikTok and on YouTube, and they're spewing all this stuff, and then you look at their lives, and their lives are a total mess. Don't, don't listen to them. Find someone whose life works. Find someone who's been married for 50 years and that their kids love to come home at Christmas. There's someone whose life is working. There's wisdom. Not the guy that can talk and he, he's, you know, a big, big fancy talker. He says, my people, God's lamenting here. My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the most high, none at all exalt me as Lord, as supreme in their lives. Backsliding means that at one time, Israel had been closer to God than they were now. They've backslidden, okay? I have been through several seasons in the 43 years that I've believed on Christ. I came to Christ at 19 years old. I'm now 62. But I have had several seasons in the last 43 years where I realized in the middle of it, I'm sliding. I've been drifting. And the answer is always simply to look again to the Lord. Follow this. The answer is to remember who God is as he's revealed himself in Christ, to look and to remember he's taken away my sin as, you're, as you've stumbled. You, maybe you've taken 10 steps and then you fell and to look back. And what are you going to see at the other end? You're going to see him saying, 10 steps, get up, come back. Let's try 12. That's what you're going to see. When you found yourself having slidden or drifted, look again to him. Don't just beat yourself up. Don't just lay there and say, I'm never going to try to walk again. What's the use? And don't just sit there and let the devil condemn you. Look again back to the one who set you up in the first place. And he's saying, come on, come back here and we're going to do this again and again and again and again. Look again to the one who's taken away our sin and remembers them no more. My people are bent on backsliding from me, God laments. Though they call to the most high, none at all, he says. He laments, exalt him. You know, if worship has dried up in my life, it means I've drifted away from looking at him. That's what it means. Because worship is a response to who he is and what he's done for us. So if worship has, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not exalting the Lord in my life, it means I've not been looking at him and to him as he's revealed himself in Christ. In Hosea's day, he revealed himself in the sacrifice at the temple. And we've talked about this in detail. The sacrifice at the temple as God prescribed through Moses was a prophetic picture of who God is and what God would ultimately do for us in Christ. Okay, in that day, it was in a shadow. In our day, we have it with the floodlights on him in Christ. God is self-sacrificing, redeeming love. If I've drifted... And I'm not exalting the Lord. And I realize my, the worship has dried up in my life. The answer is always and simply just to look again to him. Worship is a response to who he is. As we look and we realize what he's done for us. For us, it's to look at Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay? To see him is literally to love him. To see him is to literally love him because we're overwhelmed with, when you look at Christ, you're seeing the overwhelming love of God for you, for sinners. 
that's why you're down, because you fell down. You look at Christ, and it's like, there he is, loving, redeeming sinners. And the worship begins to flow. I've backslidden several seasons over the last 43 years in my heart. I've never fallen back into, I was never really a drug user. I've never committed adultery, only in my heart. But I've, I've just to be honest, I've drifted before. I didn't even realize I was drifting. And the Lord just says, look to me again, Greg. Look to me. And ah, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Reckless meaning just fully lavish, without limit. And I find myself worshiping again. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Praise you, Jesus. You know? I think of the lyrics of the old Keith Green song. Keith knew about this state. It's not just Pastor Greg who's backslidden in his heart. It's not just you, perhaps, who've experienced those seasons, but Keith Green. The guy was a prophet. He was a modern-day prophet. I don't know if, how many of you guys know who Keith Green was. Okay, he was genuinely a prophet from God. He was just... Uh, he died at 27 years old, but he, his, the impact he had was unbelievable. But he wrote this song. He said, my eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard. My prayers are cold. I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. I'm so far away from you, Lord, in other words. And the effects are my eyes are dry. My faith is old. My heart is hard and prayers are cold. I'm living for myself. But you know what? Keith knew, and it's seen in the next words of these lyrics, he knew his way back. And he says in that same song, the next words are, but what can be done for an old heart like mine? And he says, soften it up with oil and wine. Oil, the oil is you and your spirit of love. And the Bible speaks about the oil of the Holy Spirit. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. And the wine of communion is the blood, the shed blood of Jesus. Keith knew. He, and I appreciate this when preachers or prophets are honest. This is the way back. To look again to you. To ask your spirit to fill me. To wash me in the blood of Jesus. The wine of your blood. And we find ourselves thankful again, our hearts flowing again with worship. Worship is a response. Worship is a response. My people are bent on backsliding, God laments. They call, they, there's religious words, but nobody, nobody's exalting me. Worship is dried up. The answer is simply, simply to look to look again to the Lord, to look and consider Jesus crucified and you'll be drawn back no matter how bad you've stumbled and fallen down. God bursting with affection, he says next, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I give you up? How can I hand you over, Israel? Ephraim and Israel are the same, different names for the same group of people here. How can I make you like Ad Adma? How, how can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me, God says. My sympathy is stirred. How can I give you up, Ephraim? You know, it blows my mind that there are some Christian groups that say in essence that God has given up on the Jewish people, on the nation of Israel. Can you hear God's heart here? How could I give you up? He's, he takes no pleasure in chastening them. He's going to chasten them because he loves them. Like I took no pleasure in chastening my kids when they needed it. I took absolutely no pleasure in it. But I realized I love my kids. I need to discipline them because I want them to fit in with the community around them, not be despised by everybody that sees them. 
for their own sake, for their own soul. In sin, guilty before God, God looks at them. He looks at us. He looks at you and he says, how could I ever give you up? How could I ever give you up? And, 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 and it's rhetorical. It's a rhetorical question. In other words, I, I can't give you up. I won't give you up. I couldn't give you up. I will never give you up. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God repeated out to the people of Israel through the, the prophets. And Jesus said it to his disciples, which is what we are. I will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. He'll find a way to save and restore them. He'll find a way when we've wandered to bring us home. And ultimately, God sends his son, Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the the Messiah that the whole Old Testament points to and flows to. He sends them, Jesus, to save them and us. On the cross... Jesus was given up. He was given over. God looks at the, his people, his sinning people. And he says, I can't give you up. But he sent his son and he gave him up on the cross to redeem us. What love is this? What kind of love is this? What is this? That's the question that John asked in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. What, you've read these verses. 1 John chapter 3, I don't think it's up there. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. You ever, you ever repeat a Bible verse so many times you can't even hear it anymore? What John is saying there in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he's like, look at this. Behold means, check this out. What kind of love is this? And the word there actually is used for the word species. What species of love is this? That we, here's, his, here's John's wonder, that we are called by God, sons and daughters of his, that we, weak and wretched, sinful, are called, and then the next verse says, and that's what we are right now. Right now, while we're still stumbling and falling and learning to walk and backsliding, you're, all, you're called his son, you're called his daughter, and that's what you are right now. And it hasn't yet been revealed what we shall be, he says, but we know that when we see him, we'll be like him. We'll be finished then. You won't be finished until then. You'll always feel like you're, you still have a ways to go. Okay? Just so you know, Nobody here feels like I'm done, I've arrived. Just so you know. Because a lot of people come in here and you think, am I the only one that's so screwed up? No, we're all screwed up. Everybody here has sinned in the past and everybody here presently falls short of the glory of God, it says in Romans. I just quoted the Bible. What kind of love is this? What kind of love is this? How can I give you up? Ephraim, how could I give you up? I can't. I won't. I could never. I will never. How can I hand you over, Israel? I won't. How can I make you like Adma and set you like Zeboim. Adma and Zeboim are two cities that were right next to Sodom and Gomorrah. And when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, they got destroyed in that destruction. God is saying, I can't bear to allow you, Israel, my people, to be caught up in the destruction that's going to come in the judgment of this world. I can't let you be destroyed along with the judgment that's coming. My heart churns within me. Isn't that great? wild? God's heart churns within him. His sympathy is stirred up. Emotion. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God, I am not man. Notice the next line. 
after he says, I'm not, I am God, I am not man, I'm the holy one in your midst, and I will not come with terror. Though their sin deserves it, God will not utterly wipe out Israel, nor will he utterly wipe you out because now you're grafted in to the people of God. Listen, he will restore them and continue his work through them, and he will bring through them salvation to the world. We know that, and we look back on that one who has come. Okay? He never gives up on his people, no matter what. He will finish the work that he started in you. Has he started a work in you? If you're here tonight, that's a pretty strong assumption. (laughs) What are you doing in church on a Wednesday night? You're strange. You are strange. I want to be strange. Not weird, not bizarre. I don't want to be in the same boat with everyone that's floating down the, the river to destruction. We've been called out. Okay? His love and faithfulness to them is his love and faithfulness to me and you because it's through these people that Christ is coming. Okay, so what we're seeing here, God's heart churning within him. It's his love and tenacity to bring salvation to me and you because it's in them that all families of the earth will be blessed. That was the original word to the first of these people, a guy named Abraham, who was from what, what is modern day Iraq. Okay, God called him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans and he brought him to that land and he said, in you, Abraham, all families of the earth will be blessed. This promise is ultimately fulfilled in Israel's Messiah, Jesus. I will not again destroy Ephraim because I'm bringing through him. I'm bringing through these people the savior of the world. Listen, and here's where it's relevant today, not only in the first coming, but in the second. He's coming to the land of Israel and the people are being assembled on the stage. Things are being set for the second coming of Christ, even as we speak. I am not man. I love this. I'm God the Holy One in your midst, okay? A lot of people misunderstand the very definition of holy. I used to hate the word because I'm not without sin. I thought holy means without sin. That's not what it means. Holy means that God is in an altogether separate category of his own. Holy means that there's nothing that you can compare to God and there's nothing that you can put next to him and go, he's kind of like this. He's in, a, all, he's in a separate category of his own. He's not man. He's not a superman. He's God. He's completely different than us. Praise God. Because if, if God was like me, dealing with me, he would be done with me (laughs) because I'm a pain in the I'm a pain in the butt I didn't say it I just got the A out I switched it okay don't tattle on me if God was me like me he would be done with me but he says I'm not the reason why I'm never going to give you up is because I'm not like you I'm me I'm in an altogether separate category. I'm holy. That's what holy means. Now, God's holiness includes the fact that he's without sin. But that's not what defines holy. What defines holy is that he's in a different category. Part of his holiness is he's not like us, that he has no sin. That's different than me because I have all sorts of sin in my heart. (laughs) God is holy, okay? God is holy, He's altogether in a separate category of his own. His love is of a, it's like a different species. 
What kind of love would call Greg O'Pain a son of a child of God and say, that's what you are right now? That's not human love. That's God love. That's the kind of love that God loves you with. So when God looks at you and says, your sins are gone, you're clothed in my righteousness, I don't remember any flaw. I don't see any flaw in you. You're like going, I can't understand that. Yeah, you can't. That's why Paul said, I pray that you know the love of God that goes beyond comprehension. You can't grasp it because it's of a different species. It's of, it's, it's of, a, it's of God and not of man. No one is patient like God. Love is patient. God is patient. Love is kind. You know? He's not like your dad who beat you or whatever, abused you. He's not like Pastor Ed, even though he's a great man. He's he's one of the greatest of men that I've ever met. But God's way, way, way... He's not even, in, he's in a different category. He can't compare. He's holy. He's in a category of his own. And that, his, his love is of a different type, of a different species. His, our loves have limits. And then we're done. God's not like us. He's never done with us. We may forgive, but we can't forget. God says their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Who can do that? Nobody that you know here on earth, but God can. Because he's in a different category. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Let's finish this up here in the next few minutes. They, They shall walk after the Lord. He's talking about his backslidden people that are going to be taken into Assyria for a a, a harsh spanking. They will walk after the Lord. He, speaking of God, will roar like a lion. And when he roars, then his sons shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from the south, from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria in the north. And I will let them dwell in their houses. They're going to come home. They're going to be scattered in chastening, but I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to bring them back. God is speaking here of the ultimate restoration of the people of Israel in his mercy. No matter where they've been scattered in judgment, in God's chastisement, all God needs to do is roar and they'll come back. And this roar that he's speaking about here has gone out. If you know anything about history in the last hundred years, it's happening right now. God is roaring. And millions of Jewish people from all over the world, from the north, the south, the east, and the west, just like he says here, have come back. This has never happened in the history of the world. And it's the biggest problem on the face of the earth right now that they've come back to their ancient homeland. You go to Israel and you dig down anywhere in the ground and it screams Jewish. Everything they dig up speaks of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and all, and and Jesus. (laughs) All the archaeology, there's more archaeology there than anywhere in the world. There's tells that they haven't even opened up yet, and every time they open it up, it confirms what the Bible says is there. This roar has happened. It's happening. And as they returned, the land is now prospering. It was nothing. It was a barren wasteland, a wilderness. They actually bought the pieces of the land. You know that they they bought the land? They bought it, and the the people that were there were laughing at them. You want to buy this? And they were charging them 10 times the normal price. And then they pieced it together, and it started prospering. They got attacked, and they gained even more land. The roar has gone out, and the world is in an uproar. The roar, God's roar has gone out, and the people, like it says here, will be brought back. 
and the world is in an uproar. Listen to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? The nations rage and the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together at the United Nations <laughs> against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. God says, he who sits in the heavens will laugh at the attempt to destroy these people. And then the Lord shall hold them in derision and he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king, God says, on my holy hill of Zion. Mount Zion is the heart of the land of Israel. God says that is where my king will be set. And the whole world is in an uproar over this. I will declare the decree the Lord has said, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. But this psalm, it speaks of the spiritual battle that goes against the people that God has chosen to bring salvation to the world. It's a demonic spiritual attack. You know, Mark Twain called anti-Semitism the the swollen envy of pygmy minds. I think it's much more than that. It's a demonic attack on your well-being and mine because it's through them that God's bringing the cure for all of our sin. And, not, and you know what's amazing is that the cure is for everybody that's in an uproar against them as well. When Jesus is crucified, the very people crucifying he's saying father forgive them they know not what they do god loves all the peoples even the peoples that are fighting against him like paul the apostle was fighting against god when he was out killing christians and putting him in jail and god knocked him down one day on the road to Damascus and said, isn't it hard for you to kick against the goats? Isn't it hard for you to roar against me, to be in an uproar against what I'm doing? Imagine that we're all, this is the whole world in this room and we'll close with this. Imagine this is the whole world. We're in, we can't get out of here. And we're all dying. Some, there's a virus that's spread and we're all, we all got it. And we're like, we're like in this hopeless state and God breaks through the ceiling and he hands a vial of the cure to Scotty. He says, Scotty, you're my chosen. It doesn't mean you're gonna be healed and nobody else is. It doesn't mean, Scotty, you're going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell. It means, Scotty, I'm choosing you to bring it to everybody else. Now, if you're so foolish that you're gonna try to attack Scotty and say, who do you think you are? God's chosen. He's like, I didn't call myself chosen. God, he broke through the ceiling and just ha handed it to me. I want to give it to you. You going to try to kill him? If you're stupid. And he says to Scotty, I'll bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. I'm going to preserve you because I'm determined to get the cure to everybody. This is the picture. This is the most relevant thing right now in the world. The people of Israel, God has roared, they've come back, the place is prospering, it was worthless, and now everybody around them wants to kill them. It's the stage is being set for the second coming of Christ. There's a spiritual warfare, there's an irrational warfare, there's misinformation and lies going out about the history of what's been there. Christ is coming. He's coming for everybody, even those that are in an uproar, even his enemies. Aren't you glad? Because I was an enemy at one point. I'm glad he didn't say, okay, you're an enemy, I'm done with you. No, he said, you're an enemy, I'm gonna lay my life down for you. He's not like us. Man, if I was God, everybody would be toast. <laughs> Thank God he's holy. 
Lord, we thank you for your word. We praise you, God, for this work that you're doing in our world. We pray, God, that you would have mercy upon us, that we would be carriers of the gospel of Christ. We would be carriers of the, the cure. We wouldn't be caught up in hatred of anybody. Lord, that you would use us to share this amazing thing that you're doing that's happening in our world. Most, most people can't even see it, but we read your word and we're amazed that you describe these things. You call the end from the beginning. We pray that many would come to you, Lord, and understand this work that you're doing. We pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for peace in Jerusalem. We pray for Israelis and Palestinians and Gazans. We pray that you'd stop murder and hatred and slaughter and rape and all these horrible things, no matter where they're found. That you would come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. In the G name of Jesus Christ, we ask all of these things, Lord, to your glory and our greater joy and everybody who agreed said together, amen. Hey, say something nice to someone on your way out. Give a high five, fist bump, whatever you do. Get the, get the cure. Scotty's got the cure.